Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another Real-Time Revision. This is Brad Reed with the Inside Creative Writing Podcast. Uh, I appreciate you so much being a uh, member of the Patreon team. I hope you're finding these Real-Time Revisions valuable. Um, I had a little bit of a dilemma what I wanted to look at today with uh, as far as uh, revision goes. I was going to just go on to the next paragraph of my writing, uh, but as I was moving forward, I realized that I have a uh, kind of a story problem there that I need to stop and and rethink, um, and I'm just not sure quite where to go with it yet. So I wanted to put that off for a little bit till I kind of get my ducks in a row for that next uh, plot point that I'm working on. So this week I thought I'd return to something that we um, took just an initial look at a few weeks ago, and that had to do with my kill list. So we'll take a look here at the kill list again. Um, this is, uh, as it says here, words that must fight for their lives to remain in a final revision. So I uh, looked at a few of these. I want to go back to adverbs because uh, before I just looked at these L-Y adverbs, I, I searched my document to find L-Y words and came up with a ton of those and kind of walked you through how to fix some of those. Um, this week, I thought I'd look at some of these uh, less obvious adverbs. Adverbs usually stand out to me because of those L-Y endings, but we have these sneaky ones that get into our writing um, almost as often that kind of fly underneath the radar because we don't see them um, quite as apparently as those L-Y words. So I wanted to just check my writing um, to see if some of these words are starting to sneak in. Now, usually I don't do this level of editing uh, or of revision until I'm very near my final draft because I just want to go through and weed some of these out. But every once in a while when I'm rough drafting, I like to stop and just do a scan for these uh, for, t for two reasons, really. The first is to see um, if I'm starting to lean too heavily on some of these crutch words. So the more of these I get into my writing and rough drafting, the more work I have to do in revision. And um, I'm always trying to, <laughs> to find ways to do less work when I'm writing, as are you probably. So the more of these I can uh, get out of my writing when I'm rough drafting, or in other words, the more that never show up on the page to begin with, uh, the less revision that I have to do to get rid of them. So the stronger my writing is from the start. So every once in a while, I'll pop into my rough draft and just check for some of these words and see if I'm starting to lean on them too heavily. So today I wanted to look at at least a couple of these, almost and um, always. And I'm going to do like I've done before, where I'm just going to kind of jump to the middle of the draft so that we get away from uh, the... Uh, the more completely revised sections in the beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and search almost here. You can see we have 63 of these. Now that's not a, a terribly high number for my rough drafting. Um, you know, that's out of about 83, I think, 84,000 words. Um, so this isn't a huge number, but I do want to check and see how I'm using them um, just so that I'm aware when I'm rough drafting um, and I can catch them. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to throw myself here into, um, well, we'll go a little ways into the draft here before I click here and we'll see where my first, uh, use of almost is. So, um, here's a great example. So I have one here. The hike for now seemed almost pleasant except for my parched throat and empty stomach. So of course I have my uh, protagonist here. She's out in the wilds of Oregon trying to get home and she's having a pretty good day here, right? She's uh, gotten through some of the rough spots and now she's actually has this moment where she starts to begin to view this world around her as beautiful. So here's what is so, um, uh, I'm not sure the right word. I was going to say damaging. That seems a little heavy handed, but I'll, I'll use it. Here's what's so damaging about a word like almost. The hike for now seemed almost pleasant. So this almost in here is kind of just a way to be weak in your writing, right? So it's, it's not completely pleasant, um, but it's also not unpleasant. So it exists somewhere in the middle. Whenever I see this, I always ask, or I always try to put myself in the shoes of my reader, right? Is my reader going to know what I mean by this, right? So the hike for now seemed almost pleasant. Does my, does my reader know what I mean, right? How can a hike seem almost pleasant? A hike is either pleasant 
or it's not, or um, the hike is pleasant and maybe, you know, she's thinking about other things that are distracting her. But this almost is just a weak word. It just undercuts this idea of pleasant. So usually, um, there's another adverb with that L-Y in there, but usually I can just get rid of almost and make my writing just uh, say something important, right? So I could lose this and just say, the hike for now seemed pleasant, except for my parched throat and empty stomach. Anytime I can lose a comma, I like to lose commas initially. Sometimes I'll go back through on a, on a later read and realize now it really does need that comma there. Um, so I, and I struggle with this too, as an English teacher, right? I, I'm a stickler for the rules, but in creative writing, uh, rules are meant to be broken. So as long as we know where a comma should be, um, we can make that creative choice to leave it out if we think the sentence reads better. So the hike for now seemed pleasant. Um, I'm going to lose this for now because obviously for now, right? The, uh, we're not talking about the hike last Thursday. Or we're not talking about the hike uh, this coming Tuesday. We're, of course it's now. So the hike seemed pleasant except for my parched throat and empty stomach. So you can see we've shortened this quite a bit. Um, that almost was the thing that flagged me to the sentence to say, hey, I've got some issues here. Um, again, I'll come back um, in a later date and probably rework this even more. Uh, but I'm just looking for these uh, adverbs today. So let's jump down here to the next one, see what's going on. Uh, even the sun seemed just ready to break through the gray clouds that covered the world like a tent. Eh, I'm not sure I'm crazy about that. Other than some spidering cracks in the pavement, I could almost convince myself that there had been no earthquake. So again, here's this almost just cluttering up the sentence, right? How, how, what does it feel like to be able to almost convince yourself of something? Well, you either convince yourself or you don't. Um, so I feel like we can probably get rid of that. In fact, let me just take that out and see if that works. I might need to add something else. Um, even the sun seemed just ready to break through the gray clouds that cover the world like a tent. Other than some spidering cracks in the pavements, pavement, I could convince myself that there had been no earthquake. Okay, I'm going to come back later and get rid of this I could um, kind of language. Because obviously, I mean, this is first person narrative. She's all alone at this point. So she doesn't need to point to herself as I could convince myself. We all know that she's thinking about herself. She's the only person in the scene. So, but this is, again is something I'll come back to later and clean up. I'm just trying to get rid of these almosts. And uh, what was the other one we're going to look at today? Oh, always. So let's throw an always in here. 40 of those. So again, that's not terrible. Um, more than I'd like because I'd like zero. Uh, but let's see how I'm using always here and see if it's a clue as I'm rough drafting that I need to be aware of that word, have it kind of top of mind that maybe I'm overusing it. So we'll jump ahead to the 23rd out of 40th use of always. I wondered if he was going to cry. Part of me wanted him to, but I wasn't sure why. It had always scared me on the few occasions when Mike cried. But this didn't feel the same, so how? So what's happened here is she's met up with this guy on the road named Phil. They're going to be traveling partners for much of the rest of the story here. And she's trying to kind of um, figure this guy out, right? So I can't remember why she thinks he's going to cry. Oh, okay. So there's this moment where he's finally beginning to open up to her a little bit more and... Um, and uh, reveal some of his backstory. And she finds out that his wife had um, had died. And he's getting a little emotional when he's telling this. So uh, Martha's wondering here, wow, is this guy actually going to cry, right? This, this guy who seems so tough. So I wondered if he was going to cry. Um, this is something I will probably come back to because for the same thing I was just talking about. We already know that she's wondering this. If she's writing it, then she's wondering it, right? So uh, this could be um, an opportunity just to change it into a question. Was he going to cry? I really don't, I don't like putting a lot of questions in, but I'm going to let that stand for now. Was he going to cry? Part of me wanted him to, but I wasn't sure why. Um, it had always scared me. So the first thing I see is this it is weak here, right? What is this it talking about? Is the it uh, Phil? Was the it crying? Was um, the it relating back to I wasn't sure why? Uh, so this is too vague here. So was he going to cry? Part of me wanted him to. I wasn't sure, but I wasn't sure why. 
Um, it. Oh, I almost started with the same thing. It had always scared me on the few occasions that Mike cried. So the it is obviously referring to men crying, showing emotion here. So I'm going to have to, this always signals, signals me here that I've got a weak sentence, right? I've had to prop it up with this word always. So it's a flag that I have to check this sentence and see if there's a better way that it can work. So um, since I don't necessarily want to delete it right now, because I may not come up with something better, I'm just going to type something in here. So... Um, and I, f I feel like what I can do here is just to rearrange the sentence a little bit, right? On the few occasions when Mike cried, it had always scared me. On the few occasions when Mike cried, comma, it, now we know what it is referring to, right? These occasions when Mike cried, it had always scared me. I Let's just get rid of that ugly looking always because it either... Um, see, I don't need it. If I say, um, on the few occasions when Mike cried, it scared me. So, um, we don't need always in there, right? Cause that's implied in the sentence. I'm not suggesting here that sometimes it doesn't. Um, so the reader's going to assume that it always did, did on the few occasions when Mike cried, it had scared me. Uh, but this didn't feel the same somehow. So I have some other weak language in here. Somehow bothers me like something uh, bothers me. It just seems really vague. But again, that's not a uh, not the words that I'm looking for today. So I want to talk a little bit um, about just the method, this method of going through so, so deeply, right? Looking at every single sentence, every single word, making every word justified on the page, because this can get... Um, this can get overwhelming, honestly, this kind of revision. When I talk to my students in my creative and writing classes about this level of revision, a lot of times I just see their eyes glaze over because they've worked so hard to create a rough draft. They can't imagine going back through and picking it apart and looking at every single word. Um, and it can get discouraging, right? It can get a bit overwhelming. But um, I, I hinted at, or I talked about this uh, analogy last week, I think it was, and it's one that often comes to mind, especially when I'm uh, revising. And that's this idea of crafting a novel being like um, creating a sculpture, All right? So we have our rough draft where we start with this big block of uh, stone. The rough drafting is just knocking these rough edges off. So we have just the, the vaguest outline of this thing that we're going to sculpt, whether it's a man or a beast or whatever it is, um, if we're looking at the sculpture metaphor. And then revision is going back and really fine tuning that, right? Taking those tiny little chisels and chiseling off the real uh, detail work and finally polishing it. You know, every section, every, every square inch of the sculpture gets polished so that it's uh, uh, exactly like the artist intends. We're doing the same thing with a novel. Right, we can't stop with that rough drafting stage and just say, okay, you know, there's there's my story because it's got these rough, clunky edges that still need to be knocked off, and it's not polished. And polish comes from this. Um, I was going to use the word painstaking, but I actually find a lot of joy in this kind of work because it is so rewarding to be able to look at a, a section of rough, chunky, jagged language um, like we just looked at, and to start cleaning it up, right? Start putting those little elements of polish on it so that next time I read through this, it's still not going to be perfect, but boy, it looks a lot closer to what I envisioned in my head to, for that that final project pro, uh, product would be. So anyway, I hope you find this encouraging um, if you are struggling through a revision right now and kind of getting bogged down in the details. Um, but I also hope that you find it practical, right? That you've found a way to um, maybe start getting some of those words like almost and always out of your writing so that it shines a little better. So it has a little more polish on it. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining me on another real-time revision. Um, I'm super glad that you're here. I'm honored that you are a uh, member of the Patreon team. I hope you're finding good value in this. And please let me know what you'd like to hear in future real-time revisions. I would love to be able to um, look at the specific things that you are either wrestling with or curious about in your own revision and your own writing. Uh, thanks for joining me. Until next week, we will see you then.